Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Twice Told Tales. Today we have Kivor Gimasian, founder of Syrian Analysis, today uh, to discuss the current events in Syria and uh, other geopolitical things. So, welcome. Thank you very much, guys, for having me. It's a really pleasure. So, Great maybe we can start today just to talk about a little bit about the uh, earthquake, uh, this devastating earthquake and, and Syria's... Uh, uh, struggling to get aid uh, for it. What, what do you know about that? Actually, the aftermath of the earthquake, there was a big response from uh, uh, the local uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations in order to attract humanitarian aid or bring humanitarian aid because after 12 years of uh, war, destruction, sanctions in Syria, uh, the infrastructure in Syria is, uh, I, would, I would estimate, at least 50% of them are destroyed or partly damaged. And it, it was very difficult to repair the infrastructure in Syria due to the sanctions because um, there is a ban on importing uh, uh, materials that can be meant to be used in reconstruction process. And this is mentioned in the American sanctions, especially after the Caesar Act. So there are a lack of uh, materials, lack of uh, machinery, lack of uh, all sorts of uh, uh, equipment that you can use to dig in and try to uh, rescue people, for example. So uh, friendly countries, uh, they rushed uh, to Syria to um, uh, to send humanitarian aid and all these machineries. I think the number of the countries are around 20 countries now. The rest are uh, weaponizing uh, the humanitarian aid and uh, they are actually politicizing it into extent that they are only sending the humanitarian aid to the areas outside the control of the government, which means the 10 percent of the areas that were hit by uh, this deadly um, earthquake. Uh, in my opinion, sending uh, humanitarian aid only to these areas uh, is uh, uh, shameful uh, because uh, they are so many Syrians that also need this type of uh, aid and it's a very good thing that you came for help for the people of Syria because whether you live under Turkish control, Kurdish control or let's say even in Al-Qaeda held territories, those are all Syrians and in front of the Syrian law they're all treated equally so uh, there should be aid to all Syrians uh, whether they are in government or non-governmental held areas so this is the policy from the government side. But unfortunately, the Western side, they say there is a huge, um, um, big, fat lie, and I would call it a lie because they say uh, we can... Assad, Assad uh, is not opening the borders for us to operate in Syria. And the problem with this narrative is Assad doesn't control the border in the north. Uh, the yeah. border crossing in the north is in in the hands of uh, Turkey and in the hands of uh, uh, the uh, armed groups there. Therefore, uh, it he cannot have a, a control over this uh, border crossing. The, the border crossing, for example, in the south, uh, al Tanaf border crossing is controlled by the United States. And in the north is entirely controlled by Turkey. In the east is controlled by the Americans and the SDF. Uh, so if they want to send uh, humanitarian aid, it should be to the Damascus airport or from yeah. Lebanon. So, and it, both of these airport, airports and the border crossing is open if they want but to this- send. He doesn't really control the airports either because of sanctions. Like the, these uh, cargo flights don't don't feel comfortable landing, right? That's why. Uh, that's why, for example, in Algeria, when they send their cargo, they send it uh, accompanied by uh, fighter jets. And wow! Uh, wow. It, yeah, because because uh, uh, Algeria was the only country which challenged the uh, um, the American sanction in a let's say in a very direct way. Like I'm sending fighter jets with my cargos. The United wow. States, you cannot do anything about it. We know, for example, uh, the Iranian side, they send cargos uh, through Iraq, for example, or through the airport. But it, the Iranians are dealing with Syria for a very long time. And uh, and their cargos were being hit, for example, two weeks ago on the borders with Al Abu Kamal area, uh, when they were sending, um, uh, they were exporting um, uh, materials such as milk, such as uh, I've seen uh, medical masks, uh, ma- uh, medical gloves and masks there, and the Israelis claimed that it was a weapon cargo, but uh, anyone yeah. a- anyone with uh, <clears throat> 
who understands anything in 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 uh, military affairs when you see the aftermath of the bombing of these cargoes and you see there were no explosion spots on the ground nothing was burned uh, or exploded into the diagram of the area right yeah then there, there is no weapon if there is weapon and ammunition it explodes and see this well, to, a, to a zionist uh, you know a pregnant woman in gaza is carrying a weapons cargo so like their their definition of what of what what threatens what threatens Israel is a lot different than what you would expect. It's actually that a healthy Syrian population is what threatens Israel. So the problem, like, the problem with Israel is they can um, they can do whatever they want in Syria without consequences. And aren't they publicly writing articles saying that they're wanting to target weapons? Con- uh, I mean, uh, humanitarian yeah, convoys, calling them weapons convoys. It's public. They're writing it in the Israeli press that they're planning to target Israeli. Yes. I mean, yeah, uh, they threatened that they would do aid. that. And it's like, how can you write that? It, how can a general public of Israel support targeting think, of humanitarian aid? I think, I think anything Israel targets in Syria, uh, you will see a pattern after that. You just open any any mainstream outlet, and you will see Iran Iranian affiliated groups. So Iranian affiliated groups, whether they are bringing humanitarian aid, whether they are uh, bringing anything else into Syria, it's a legitimate target from their perspective, although it's completely uh, against international law. But who is going to bring Israel into justice? Uh, That's the question. If the media is uh, with them and if the United States is with them and even Russia nowadays, they don't challenge the uh, Israeli position in Syria because they also need to keep Israel on a neutral position when it comes to Ukraine, for example. And they don't want to have a clash with uh, with Israel over uh, certain geopolitical cases. But now, since Netanyahu is uh, bragging about, well, we probably would like to send some air defenses to, uh, to Ukraine, this will change the equation in Syria uh, because uh, it's a tit for a tat. And if Israel supplies such a type of weaponry to Ukraine, that means uh, Syria will receive more advanced uh, air defense systems from Russia uh, or uh, be encouraged to use their uh, sophisticated weaponry against Israeli warplanes. But also another problem pops up here that Israel doesn't violate nowadays the airspace of Syria. They only uh, come from the Mediterranean uh, and the regional waters or over Lebanon and they bomb Syria or from the Golan Heights. So they don't penetrate the airspace of Syria, especially after the 2018, when Syria uh, gun, gunned down an Israeli fighter jet, the F-16, while they were bombing Syria. After that, they never penetrated the airspace. They bombed it from the neighboring countries uh, to Syria. So <clears throat> the, here, is, here comes the legality. Are you allowed to shoot uh, on Israeli warplanes flying over Lebanon? or flying on a regional waters in the Mediterranean, uh, although what Israel is doing in Syria is illegal, but Syria is not Israel. Anything you do in Syria, if you breathe two times more than you, uh, you, you're you supposed to breathe, they will bring you, they, they, yeah. they want to bring you into, like make you accountable for that, right? And Syria has to be very careful in dealing with Israel nowadays because its priority is to uh, bring the country together liberate the uh, uh, all the territories, whether from the terrorists, from the Americans or from the Turks, and to bring a social cohesion again and unity among the Syrians. Uh, it, it makes no sense, in my opinion, uh, to have a clash with Israel from the Syrian side if you aren't um, politically, militarily, economically uh, uh, stable. And uh, the Syrians do not want to go into the, uh, like, go along the provocation of the Israelis, they can respond if they want to. And I'm not giving uh, like information, it's just my analysis. They can respond. But do they want to open a front with Israel after all this distraction? I think uh, the priority should be in the defensive lines. Um, and there are, are now reports. Uh, the Newsweek, for example, um, reported uh, that uh, Syria has is receiving uh, um, advanced air defense systems from Iran, and there will be um, joint uh, operation uh, uh, for these uh, air defenses from the Newsweek perspective. As much as I know uh, the decision making uh, mentality in Syria, I, I rule out the possibility that the Syrians would allow Iranians to have uh, um, 
uh, independent or joint um, or operation of these systems. They will receive the Iranian weapons, but it will be completely under Syrian control. But why the Newsweek says this or other reports say that Iran may have its independent air defense operational capability in Syria because um, they want always to raise the uh, or to bring this narrative that Iran is in Syria as an occupation. Iran is in Syria to threaten neighboring countries. So this is the narrative that they sell to the people. But facts underground, I can tell you, there are no Iranian forces in Syria. Yeah. There are there are Iranian advisors, and they were in Syria before the war, just like the uh, Russian advisors before the war, and just like the North Korean advisors before the war, and uh, there are mutual agreements for to, for sharing military information, technology, and all this stuff. Even Hezbollah nowadays, uh, they have a very minimum forces in Syria. Uh, during between 2012 and 2018, for example, I would estimate the numbers reached to 20,000 fighters from Hezbollah in Syria. But now you don't have this. Uh, they have probably a few hundreds and checkpoints just trying to make sure that the terrorists, for example, in the desert, uh, ISIS would not um, advance into Damascus or come back to Palmyra or on the border crossing in Abu Kamal. This areas, I would say yes, and uh, and and but the numbers are very, very, very few. They don't even represent a threat to anyone because Syria is overstretched in this war in 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 the country and it's exhausted. So they needed um, their allies to help, and they came to Syria with the official invitation of the Syrian government, unlike the American forces, exactly. which they invited themselves. <laughs> Nobody invited yeah, them exactly. to Syria. But I think one thing. Yeah, Americans that's the point. Don't understand. Oh, sorry. About let's add this one thing about Iran, the uh, like advanced air capacity is that they get a lot of this because they shot down a bunch of American drones and they've been reverse engineering U.S. technology. So this yes. is extremely, uh, I mean, it's very impressive ingenuity, and it's also like, uh, I mean, it underscores why the American system is so uh, antagonistic about this export of of technology to both Russia and Syria. So. I am I am highly confident that the American problem with uh, the people in the region let's say is not only about geopolitics it's about knowledge. And knowledge uh, it always uh, should be kept exclusive for them. When you have the knowledge uh, you can also advance your country economically, militarily, and politically. You could have a better influence in the region. So uh, without knowledge, uh, uh, Norman Finkelstein once said the American strategy in the region is to keep, to put the Arabs in their place and keep them in their place. This is about, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the uh, Iranian knowledge about uh, the nuclear technology, Iranian knowledge about drone technology, Iranian knowledge about long-range missiles. Now the kamikaze drones of Iran in Ukraine, it, it hurts the American proxies there. It hurts them because the uh, Iranians now aren't only keeping this technology for themselves, they're actually selling weapons to Russia when historically speaking, it was Russia which used to supply such technology and weapons to the uh, to the people in the region, right? During the Soviet mm -hmm. era, who was selling the weapons to Syria or to Iraq or to uh, to other countries? But now we have a weapon supplier, a, um, a country that knows how to produce a certain type of weaponry that can defend itself. And when it's necessary to harm the enemy, if they attack the country and it, Iran doesn't stop that, like they are training, um, for example, the Russian forces on using these drones. Do you think the Russians would take these drones and just use it? No, it needs training. Just, so the, the knowledge on the knowledge side, there is a, all there was always this was like the United States here and the rest of the world there. And now the countries are starting to learn from the American experience. Like, w what does it mean for the Iranians to bring down an American drone without shooting it? Yeah, like, they electronically li hijacked it and landed literally it. Literally taking Obama over. <laughs> You know, you know what does that mean? That means the Iranians now have the technology. They have the uh, all, all the uh, codings of these drones. So if United States had five thousand pieces of these drones, these five thousand drones are not trash. 
they can't even use them again because they yeah. will be hacked again. They have to change the entire technology of it. So the same applies in Ukraine. They say we're going to send uh, tanks. What what they, what the Americans did in this regard? They pushed the Germans to send their yeah. Leopard tanks to Ukraine. And they said, oh, we have to produce new tanks. We can't send our current tanks because if we send our current tanks, that means if the Russians take take over our tank, they will know the technology. So no, we are producing new tanks. The, the, the outlook of the tank is the same, but we will put a technology from the 70s and send it to Ukraine so that if the Russians uh, take over these tanks, they would not know our nearest technology. They would know the technology that they already know 40 years ago. So, uh, <laughs> so this is related to the information warfare, right? The knowledge warfare. Yeah. They don't want to share this information with the Russians. The same thing applies to Iran. They don't want Iran to know much. They don't want Syrians to know much. So uh, ignorance it will always creates uh, internal uh, domestic uh, problems. And when the people are uh, aren't educated or aren't advanced, they can't cope with the uh, technological knowledge of the in the West or the rest of the. You will always see them as a superior, and this is the problem with uh, some people in the region. They always look to the West as if uh, they are in a sorry, but in a position of a god that we have to always look at them like this. No, sorry. I respect your I respect your advance, and um, if you see the historical cycle, you learned from us a lot, like uh, two thousand, three thousand years ago. You learned from our scientific achievements, and then the circle of the history came that you learned from us, and now we are learning from you. But they want to keep this ex exclusive for them. I was studying in France in two thousand and nine and two thousand and ten, and in the university they were. Uh, uh, there was a nuclear, uh, civil nuclear uh, faculty. So people, if they want to learn about the nuclear technology and uh, this stuff, to to run a civil nuclear program in Western countries. So I asked the professor if uh, I wasn't part of that program, uh, but I, I asked my professor there if like a, someone from Syria, from Iran, from Iraq, from Palestine, can enroll in this faculty and he said no only yeah, only 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 too. french only french and when they are graduated uh, they have to sign on a paper before graduation that they will work exclusively for french nuclear uh, sector and they they aren't allowed to share this uh, knowledge with anyone outside uh, of france so what is this about what does this tell you they don't want to share uh, their knowledge with us. So when we try to um, uh, um, to create a sector uh, that can cope with with the with the advance in the West, they come and strike. What they did, what did the Americans did do and the Israelis do in Syria at the beginning of the war? The first, the first, the first things that they did in Syria, they assassinated the scientists. They uh, like people were walking in the Damascus in safety, trying to get their car and go to work, and somebody comes and shoots them in the head. And those were the scientists, physical, Iran, yeah. physical scientists, chemical scientists, uh, engineers, doctors. In Iraq, they like literally cleans the country from their intellectuals. This is not a coincidence. Like a person like uh, his name was Johnny. I'm not 100% sure. I will check now on, uh, on in my browser. And uh, he was the head of the Iraq's National Museum. And he was revealing how the Americans looted the uh, the uh, the artifacts of Iraq. And he was uh, preparing a documentary. And oh, I remember he, that. Uh, yeah. Johnny, what was his name? Yeah. I, I will check. He, yeah, when, I don't remember the name, but I've heard he was He was in Canada with the producer of the movie, and when he landed in the United States, he had a heart attack and died <sighs> in the United States. This, those, those are not coincidental things. No. Like in no, Syria, no. ISIS attacks yes. Palmyra two times. Like what military, what type of military value Palmyra has in the middle of the desert, except that it it presents a value, a civilization value. So, at sometimes when I say um, 
um, psychopaths rule the United States, people think I'm being biased or I'm being exaggerated. I'm exaggerating. I'm not a serious. Like, if you follow what the Americans did in the past three decades, at least since I woke up into politics, I wouldn't expect anyone but a psychopath or a group of psychopaths who would do such things uh, yep. to their children. And it, imagine, imagine, imagine if you are a politician and um, you are imposing sanctions on Iraq and you killed uh, half a million children and the journalist yeah, asks and, that, and, and, if, and, and if a journalist asks you about it at least you try to uh, like turn around the question right but when you say we think the price is worth it <laughs> I think I think exactly I th that's that's too, that's beyond that's beyond reason you know in Syria um, and the, uh, and, the, and the way they talk about sanctions and brag about sanctions, the way they say that we should, for example, the, the most recent one, that we should not allow um, uh, the Syrian government to reconstruct, and we have to block that. That was, I don't remember her name, but uh, one of these, uh, yes. um, like, American politicians. And, or, or, like, about the assassination of Iran's nuclear scientists. That's what Israel has bragged about. It's not something that they hide or try to like you know um say that it wasn't it was uh, it was different or anything they're bragging about it or they're bragging about how sanctions have made people um uh, like so poor or they're working and now you're seeing people selling their kidneys to make a living and they're they're like actually proud about it or or even i mean like they don't uh, uh yeah, but hide they commented. I mean, they, you have to be specific the U.S. official commented on the actual fact that Iranians are having to sell their kidneys to survive. He commented on that and he said it was a good thing. Laughing. Yes. Yeah. yes. And you know, the biggest yeah, the, the biggest powerhouse for people who buy uh, organs is in Israel, in the world. Yeah. Uh, just check. You know, uh, uh, for a very long time, we all know that. And, you know why, uh, though? The, the why is even more interesting. It's because... Uh, Israelis don't believe that they should have it, that they can be buried without all their parts. So yes. they don't want to donate their own organs. So they have to have organs from others. They can't have them from Israelis. So yes, they have to, wow. yeah. Now the Russians uh, accused uh, also Israel and other countries, but mainly Israel, uh, for buying the organs of. Uh, so there is a black market in Ukraine now. And uh, when the Ukrainians uh, kill a Russian soldier or even kidnap them, they are uh, harvesting their organs, sometimes even alive. And they are selling wow. the organs in the black market. And um, in, in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, and I'm not saying this, this is state sponsored, but they definitely should have contacts in the Israeli government to bring all these organs right into Israel. So they are sending mostly into Israel. And um, I think they're making huge, huge, huge uh, profits uh, out of it. It's really sad to see this. And it's really sad that when you treat these issues, people are being accused of anti-Semitism uh, because this is not directed against a person because of his religion. We're talking about the behavior of gangs. If, uh, if a group of Muslims in Syria, and they did, like the white helmets, they are Muslims. They were born Muslims and they consider themselves Muslims. And when they harvested the organs of the kids and harvested the organs of the Syrian soldiers who died and they sold them into the black market in Turkey, nobody said this is uh, uh, anti-Islam or anti-Muslims, right? Exactly. We're talking when you about say Turkey. Or when you say Turkey, the biggest the biggest customer of the organs in Turkey is Israelis. So just yeah. to just so uh, back so, to Turkey. So, so so this accusation has become very uh, uh, ridiculous that you can accuse anyone of anti-Semitism without any proof. Now they're coming after um, a Swiss intellectual. His name is Daniela Ganza, and in my opinion, he is the one of the last intellectuals in Europe who can bring uh, a solid analysis uh, on the situation in the Middle East, in Ukraine, very critical to the ruling elites. And now they banned him from uh, speaking in Germany because in one of his speeches he criticized uh, Israel and now consider him an anti-Semite. Uh, so criticizing policy of Israel or individuals who hold the Israeli passport doesn't amount into into bashing or or being an anti 
ethnic group or anti-religion, uh, this is a weapon that they use against anyone uh, to 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 discredit. Like, uh, if if but if you're a Jew, like Norman Finkelstein, like Max Blumenthal, Aaron Mate, they 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 don't they can't call them anti-Semites, but they call them uh, self-hating Jews. So it's pretty obvious that they're weaponizing this uh, against the critics of uh, of uh, Israel or the official narrative. So they're hiding they want to under make the it... of peace-loving Jews. Sorry, go ahead, Sadir. Yeah, yeah. They they just want to make it very costly for anyone to criticize um, the like the policies of the United States or Israel. Uh, I forgot the name of this uh, professor, the, this international law professor who criticized uh, just recently. He criticized Israel's policies, and I think he was dismissed from the university. Do you remember, Chris? Uh, uh, I think we talked about that. Yeah, who was that? He's. Uh, I mean, he, every he was year, a prominent professor. There's a long list of. A long list. Yeah, of, there is. <laughs> yeah, it's not just one person. Yeah, <laughs> I know, but you know, that's that's crazy how they're making. Hmm. And about the monopoly of um, science and knowledge, it's it's not only in the military, but I mean, we talked about uh, those related to power and politics, but that's also very, uh, I mean, it's very important to notice that uh, how um, they're trying to uh, hold a monopoly of science and knowledge and not allow the development of knowledge to other countries. I mean, that's basically how Iran has been um, supporting resistant groups uh, in the region, mostly, but it's not always uh, providing that physical weapons. It's uh, in a lot of cases, it's teaching them or training them uh, and just transferring the knowledge, knowledge. And it's an everlasting thing. And um, the, the problem is, uh, yes, they may try to like assassinate our scientists or maybe because um, especially recently they have been threatening to attack uh, Iran's, um, I don't know, like nuclear uh, power plants. Um, you can't erase the knowledge. Like you may make it slow down and uh, create problems, but the knowledge will be there and it will be transferred to the next generations and to the next yes. nation, to other nations. So. Um, yeah, and I think the globalists here, the globalists here, uh, like globalization helped them a lot in the past decades, but it also helped us the 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 flow of information and uh, it it also benefits us so they found out that this is also uh, we say in arabic a double edged sword so it can also harm them right that is why the they push towards one world government right that's why they're doing that. ex exactly now after after covid they they accelerated this into the one world government and this is not a conspiracy theory they are saying it they're talking about it actively yeah in the media about uh, the Great Reset, about Build Back Better, in the World Economic Forum, all these rich uh, um, oligarchs with former or current politicians and elites. It's uh, obvious to me that we are heading into an authoritarian body uh, that is uh, that has a huge influence over people's thoughts and opinions and how they should think and what should they think. And this happened especially accelerated after Corona. I'm mentioning it because of the censorship that accelerated again uh, on, an, uh, on a public uh, debate that nobody is uh, able to question anything that they tell you, even if it comes to your own body. And this is very dangerous. Exactly. If you lose, If you lose an autonomy over your body, Nothing is left in you. Imagine uh, here in Germany, like you can't work. You can't go to the office and work if you're not jabbed. But uh, some people uh, have a different opinion about it. And some people have reservations. Some people have medical conditions. Some people uh, um, truly are scientists and saying uh, the mRNA vaccines, for example, in their opinion, uh, they could have side effects. And we have to check if a person has a certain heart condition or, uh, or a diabetes or stuff, whether they should take it or not. But this discussion was completely censored and everything was taken over. Now on Twitter, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of Elon Musk. I'm not a fan. But what Elon Musk did, he, he put a mirror 
in front of in the face of this uh, previous uh, administration of Twitter, which was embedded with the FBI and the NSA, and he released all these internal documents that show there is no difference between the CIA and Twitter, and you can you can apply the same on Facebook and YouTube, and so they are they have a big monopoly over the platforms where people can access to information. So nowadays, anyone who wants to create an alternative platform, they can suppress it in the Google Store. They can suppress it in the Apple Store. Uh, it has become, um, um, uh, we are in a stage where they want not only to keep the information for themselves, but they want to tell us what is correct and what is wrong. Even when it comes to our countries, like yeah. somebody somebody comes like imagine i post something about syria just a hypothetical uh, uh, example and the fact uh, what do they call them F uh, fact, uh, fact checkers? checkers imagine a fact checker would come and fact check me about my country like the, like imagine someone who doesn't have a medical degree and yesterday i was watching the yeah, it's all this interrogation about uh, the Twitter sus suspending the medical professionals on Twitter. So, lady, do you have a medical degree? No. So what gives you the authority to censor someone who has a medical degree uh, who is specialized in this field? So uh, we, are in, at, we are living in a time of these woke people. They call themselves work and they think they have the exclusive truth and they also believe in authoritarianism. They believe in suppression of opinion. They believe in suppression of uh, uh, different opinions in this regard. And they, with one click, they can cancel you. But with that's because they, they, don't have the, they don't have the facts. So the only way they can fight the narrative is by censorship. And what's really fascinating about what you brought up is like, they're censoring in one way, but in another way, if you're if you're a, if you understand how to do research, like all the stuff about the mRNA vaccination, there's like 30 years of history of research on that in animal studies. You can go read that, which I did, and it became very clear that this is not something you want to inject in your body. And even the papers themselves say in the animal studies that this is not not indicated for human use because of what could happen. And they only ever certified that. Uh, in like extreme cancer patients where the person was probably going to die anyway and it was yes. just a crack because the danger in the long run is really uh, it's it doesn't have good prognosis neither does uh, any of the veterinary vaccines they try to develop for coronavirus types you know coronavirus is like a, a group of viruses it's not just one type of one specific yes. virus anyway there's always been coronaviruses in livestock and they've been trying to develop vaccines for a long time they really went hard on it after SARS-1 when uh, they were like, well, maybe we can do a human vaccine. And then they looked at, and so if you read all that, it's all available on PubMed, Pub, PubMed and the other uh, uh, databases of research journals. You can look them up. They're not censored. But what they're censoring is the will of the people to do that research because they're trying to get the most parts of society to think that there isn't any information out there. And so they have to just accept the authoritarian line. So that way they don't actually have to like, they can they can silence science in the public rather than yes. in, the, in the university, which is interesting. I am myself, yeah, I'm, I shared... pro, I'm pro vaccines. Oh yeah, actually, I'm, Satera, uh, yeah, tell your stats are real no, I'm, I'm, I'm pro vaccines that I've taken all my necessary vaccines. I'm thankful for the measles vaccines and the lots of vaccines that I took when I was a kid that uh, kept me alive because these were uh, helpful. But there was a long term data about this and there were no uh, very exactly. minimum side effects on myself. And um, when the corona hit at the beginning, I was also afraid, scared like anyone else. Uh, but uh, as a journalist, I'm not a, I'm not a medical professional, but as a journalist, I can smell corruption like yeah. uh, it, 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 and it's like in front of you, they're showing you the the path they're telling you why they are vaccinating you they're telling yeah. you that if we vaccinate you you will get your digital passport they're telling you if you have a digital passport we're going to e-wallet we're telling you if you have a e-wallet then we're going into a social credit system and they're telling you if they are social credit system they can take you out from the uh, banking system they can just close your bank account if, right. if exactly. like they're telling you where are we going but, but 
Uh, Bill Gates set up a whole organization called ID2030, I think is what it's called, or 20-something. He has a whole organization that he funds, which is meant to do that. So it's like, it's not a conspiracy at all. But I just wanted to say that uh, for YouTube, I learned this from Jimmy Dore, that YouTube, everyone should take the vaccine. The mRNA vaccine is fantastic. We're not saying don't take it. It's safe and effective. It saves you from everything. Actual death itself, you'll live forever. So take the vaccine. So we're not saying not take the vaccine. You should definitely take it. It'll save everything. Jimmy is so funny, really. I really. (laughs) It's amazing. YouTube says it's great. So YouTube says it's great. You should inject it in yourself. Inject it multiple times a day. Whatever they tell you to do, keep taking it. You know, every company that makes it, anyone who sells, if a, a guy standing on the corner of the street says he's got an mRNA vaccine he wants to sell you, take it. Because you can't yeah. go wrong with the vaccine. And right. if there is any objective truth in front of you and you see anyone that was harmed, just say it's a conspiracy. Turn the point. It's all a conspiracy. Exactly. Everything's a conspiracy, except exactly. that the vaccines do good for you and they do not cause heart attacks. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about that. Yeah. So, I so Tara, tell, talk about your Instagram experience because that's really yeah. important. I shared a, a link on my Instagram story, which was to a list of. Uh, scientific papers on the um, side effects of mRNA vaccines. And without any warning or anything, Instagram deleted my account permanently. Yeah. Like I didn't even receive it. And, and it was scientific papers. I didn't talk. I wasn't expressing my opinion on anything. I was just sharing. It was a bibliography yes. from PubMed. Exactly. <laughs> what what they do. Like- <laughs> what they do on Instagram and Facebook is very easy from their side. This is screenshot that you shared, there could be other people who shared it. So they publicize this screenshot uh, in the uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So w- when you post it, there, there is not anyone who manually deletes that. It's just automatically the AI deletes it and they uh, they consider this a, a high harm level of misinformation. So you would be deplatformed. Uh, I was uh, warned many multiple times by Instagram that I will be banned. Let's see when. But I'm sorry, but I have a friend. Uh, he's, he's 32. He was and in three weeks he died. And uh, I have another friend here in Germany. He has done now an open heart surgery and his girlfriend, she's taking medication to regulate her heart rate. So I, I sorry, but I can How see are they are both ter- in the early 30s. Jesus. So wow. they are there are issues coming with it. But yeah, anyways, well, we can talk. Uh, we can... Thailand apparently has been in a coma since November. Uh, let's hope the ruling family they would come after fighter. <laughs> I hope that's a true story. I had no way to verify it. I mean, I tried really hard to. Be, oh, there's only that what one. What is the secret Bakti who's reporting it? And I wish I could. I knew someone who spoke Thai. If any of you mm-hmm. listeners speak Thai and you can post some links mm-hmm. to Thai news reporting on the subject, I would love to have another source other than Bakti. Even though I don't think he's, he's like I don't. I don't have any reason, and nothing I've heard him say makes me not think he's like concocting stories, and he's Thai, so, uh, but uh, yeah, I would love to know more about that. Yeah, yeah. One of the strongest uh, arguments that I've heard, um, uh, like pro-vaccine, was at the gym from a lady who was complaining that why not everyone is wearing a mask while they're exercising, and uh, why everyone should be vaccinated and everything. And I, uh, and there were like two of us saying that, well, they're not, uh, I mean, the, the study is going on and nobody's sure and everything. And she was like, but if you die vaccinated, you're going to say, at least I took the vaccine and I died. I'm like, <laughs> uh, uh, this is a, this is the zombie culture. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is the zombie culture. They have, uh, when Dr. Melon said uh, uh, they, this is a mass psychosis, he's correct. This is a mass, mass psychosis. People, exactly. when they willingly, will, like willingly walking into a hole. Uh, just a second. Yeah. Sorry. So they're willingly walking into a trap and they think they're doing the right thing. And at the same time, they're very angry people, uh, full of uh, revenge. They uh, like project their own personality on other people. Um, I met um, um, a woman here uh, who is also ethnic Armenian. 
and she works with the Social Democratic Party here. Uh, so I, it was like an opportunity to have a connection and stuff. And it was the beginning of uh, the vaccination. And she told me like she took already both of them. And I told her I'm still waiting for the data, like uh, sufficient data to to decide whether or not I want to take it. And and uh, because of my what I said, she she left and she refuses to talk to me again because I'm a dangerous wow. person to the society and I would be killing her That's grandfather. Really Probably I'm killing her grandfather in Armenia from Germany. So um, um, it's it's really a zombie culture that uh, uh, mm -hmm. I don't exaggerate about this. When the Ukraine war start, when the Ukraine war started um, and and or now in Syria or the vaccination etc. People are programmed and there They're is fine. there is no there is no um, p possibility to discuss with these people because. They're very angry and vicious, and they are ready to uh, slander you and talk uh, very badly about you. So I completely uh, try to avoid discussion with this uh, type of people. But uh, it also makes me mad because it, ma it makes uh, me scared because, like, I I never understood how like a situation like the you know Holocaust or all these other horrible societal level like acts of complete violence would happen but now i can absolutely see clearly the path towards that because yes i understand can... how how did wow. people because uh, the 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 enemy is always the other and and yeah. th this was clearly obviously the case during the nazi era that now we can see it in front of our eyes how they turned the people against each other and made the people uh willing to harm other people based on their medical status or their political status so what and the makes weakest people... most vulnerable people in society like they're willing to do all this to like they say save granny but they're actually just putting these elderly people in solitary confinement for the last years of their life it's horrifying yes it is it is but now it shows it shows it shows that if if in europe they want to go into fascism. They can. They can do it uh, easily, in my opinion. Not oh, because yeah. most. Of, not That's because true. most of the people want to be uh, fascist, but because they aren't willing to challenge the narrative. And uh, like, see the difference of uh, the the reaction with what's happening in Ukraine and what has happened in Syria. Like, why there was no. Um, similar sympathy help to the Syrians like they did with Ukraine because they weren't told to they weren't told to and now with the with this um, uh, earthquake that hit Syria uh, where are all these uh, organizations in Germany who were collecting all this money to Ukraine like you, if you go to anywhere any store any shop any place in in the street and in inside the stores everywhere people were collecting money for Ukraine and now nobody is collecting money for Syria and in the contrary it is all going to one part in Syria which is uh, I already talked about that but it yeah. makes you mad because they 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 are uh, again when I mention Elon Musk because he's funny about this I support the current thing he says like uh, it's just something that uh, when the media tells you you have to support this they support it. so in my opinion uh, the difference between some uh, autocratic countries and democratic countries here in the West is they are both autocratic, but here they are a little bit smarter. Here they don't uh, send you to jail if they disagree with you and in politics in most in most of the times now because they're sending in jail people for uh, having an opinion on Ukraine. But most of the cases they don't. But what they do here is um, they control the media. Uh, and they can exert hegemony over the people that into extent that they can control their minds and they can control their reactions and they can control their actions. And when you go against the tide, they don't come and just like throw you in jail directly, but they smear you. They commit character assassination. The media is in their hands. They create a villain uh, in the society and they say, look, this guy is dangerous. Be careful. His, his pictures are everywhere. You can't now walk freely in the street. You can't uh, uh, work in the public uh, uh, arena. Like if you are a journalist, you're in the public arena, right? So which newspaper or which TV channel will hire you if he if the if the human resources department Google you and they find like 
oh my God, all these articles about you calling your names and saying, so why would he go in with, with a controversial person, right? So this is how they kill you here. They don't send you to jail, but they kill your career. They kill your reputation and they yeah. put you in an invisible jail, which is an economic jail that you cannot uh generate money anymore so you have exactly. to go and make your own work and this is something i i think it was just a i mean i was it was just a luck when i in 2017 i said i want to create a youtube channel i never thought that i'm gonna make it like a career i just thought like i'm gonna make it a service uh for syria i want to show the truth i never monetized my videos till 2021 uh like never wanted it to be career but then when the media came after me and they tried to uh, be very very aggressive uh, like uh, call you all sorts of names anyways i was like no now i'm losing my income i'm they are trying to make me lose my job so i will uh, monetize my videos and i gain as much as i can uh, uh, from youtube because i believe if they start smearing you they won't stop until they completely finish the job. Like they don't stop the halfway, like uh, until they completely make you lose your job and you don't have a fixed job here or a, or a contract with any company. So I was like, no, now then I will work. If I'm working, if I'm spending a, a week, 20 hours on YouTube, now I will spend 40 hours on YouTube. I will do it my full time job. And I will create my own business because they will come after me. But I'm very careful on YouTube and yeah. with what I say. And uh, I, I know how to play over these uh, their so-called community <laughs> guidelines. And since five years, I haven't been banned on on, uh, on YouTube, except one time. They deleted one of my videos. And I think you know Robert Incla Robert Inkladesh. What was his name? He's in. Uh, uh, he was in. Pa uh, Robert Inlakesh. In Inlakesh. In like, in yes, he was in Palestine. I don't know if he's now in Palestine, but uh, I did an interview with him while he was in Palestine, and they deleted it because it, they say it's a hate speech. So, really? <laughs> well, Germany has insane, insane Zionist law. I mean, you could if you just say the Holocaust didn't happen on YouTube, they'll put you in prison. Like, it's crazy. Like, I mean, there's no free speech around that at all. I mean, like, you can't be even a lunatic. Like, they don't even let people be crazy people. Like, if you're, I don't understand it. I mean, I guess if you are homeless in uh, Germany, the best way to find shelter is to deny the Holocaust. So I don't know. It's a, it's, it's bizarre. It's a bizarre way of operating, I think. Because it makes you, it makes it feel like, well, maybe there is something to that story. <laughs> Because if you're not just allowed to be a crazy person, I don't know. I mean, I mean, in Germany, it has its own uh, history. Um, I mean, uh, I, I now since I live here, I think, uh, um, uh, of course, I, I don't, I, I don't have an opinion if you should really send someone to jail for denying the Holocaust or not. But uh, there should be more open conversation about everything. And sure. I think uh, the term Holocaust, because I come also from an Armenian family and we had a genocide. Yeah. The, the the number, if if you disagree on a number, if you tell me there were about one million Armenians died and not one and a half million, for me, that's not the biggest issue because the bigger issue was there was the intention to exterminate the ethnic Armenians. The yeah. in international law, when there is an intention, if you kill only five people with the intention of ethnically cleansing that ethnic group or religious group, it's called a genocide. Like they yeah. what like the rebels, so-called rebels did in northern Latakia. They killed people based on their religion. It was an act of ethnic cleansing, right? Uh, with the Holocaust, there was an intention to ethnically cleanse the Jews here. I'm not a historical expert in this regard. I uh, the, I don't know if the six million is a correct uh, figure or not. But what I know that for sure, for 100 percent, that the Ukrainians participated in the ethnic cleansing of the uh, Jews especially in uh, Western Ukraine. And Stepan Bandera was Stepan Bandera was the ally of uh, Hitler. And um, the disagreement popped up uh, between uh, Bandera and Hitler only when Hitler occupied uh, parts of Ukraine and he was advancing to Russia. The disagreement popped up because Bandera wanted his independent country. So the, 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 this uh, clash between Hitler and Bandera, because Bandera was then in jail, it was a political, not ideological, just like the issue between ISIS and Al-Nusra. 
like they have uh, they share the same uh, uh, ideology but they were fighting over who is going to have more weapons who's going to occupy more territories who's going to uh, have more uh, uh, fuel fields in Syria this was their uh, disagreements so yeah. the banderists in Ukraine they never died like the idea oh they're welcomed uh, in the US Congress the speaker of the house like basically gives them hugs now it's crazy now I think this is a nice recap for World War II. Those who were absent from history classes, now they know uh, how things worked out in World War II and why probably the Allies intervened uh, at a later stage to World War II uh, because Russians were winning the war, basically. <laughs> and, and, and if you win a World War, you know what's going to happen. You're going to dominate the world, right? And um, uh, it's very yeah. sad to see that nowadays... Uh, uh, the neo-Nazi scene in Ukraine has become very accepted in in Europe. Uh, the Azov uh, t-shirts are being sold here online in the stores. Uh, wow. you, you can buy the flag of the Azov battalion, but if you carry the Syrian flag, you are a fascist. You wow. are an Assadist, you are a fascist, you are a neo-Nazi. The, 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 the world is upside down. We are the people who are fighting fascism in Syria because these uh, so-called Islamists in Syria, they are far-right Islamist groups that do not believe in um, multicultural Syria. They wanted to ethnically cleanse the uh, um, not only the minorities, the Muslim Sunnis who were politically against their own uh, project. Take what happened in Aleppo. Aleppo never Never went, never wanted this war, but in 2012, after one and a half year uh, for the eruption of the war, the Turks, uh, through their proxies, they invaded uh, Aleppo and they killed around 14,000 uh, Sunni Muslims in in Aleppo. Right? So nobody calculates these numbers that the Muslims suffered under uh, ISIS. Uh, uh, they assassinated uh, uh, Sheikh Ramadan al Bouti the highest ranking uh, uh, cleric in Syria. They killed the son of the Grand Mufti of Syria. So uh, these people wanted uh, Daesh uh, in Syria. And we, uh, we put all our differences aside with the government, with Assad, with everything, because we know, we know, we know the history. We know what happened in Afghanistan in the late 90s, uh, 70s and early uh, 80s. We know the scene of the Arab Mujahideen that Jimmy Carter started and he, then came his successor. We know the first um, Chechen war. We know the second Chechen war. We know the Iraq war. We have an experience in this. So uh, when Professor Mikhail Hudson, um, uh, in one of his uh, interviews in 2014, he says Al-Qaeda is a contract army for the United States. I truly believe it is the case. It is not a coincidence. Everywhere the United States goes into war, Al-Qaeda doesn't come like fighting shoulder to shoulder with the United States, but they're fighting against the enemies of the United States. So they're doing the yeah. job of the Americans. Well. It's even more like that. It's it's part of this, you know, the theory of full spectrum dominance. So, like, if you're fighting a war and you control even your enemy, the like the American people believe Al Qaeda is their enemy, and so if America also controls Al Qaeda, the deep state also controls Al Qaeda, then they fully control the perception of the American people because they control the battle space. So they can say, oh, here's the enemy, we have to bomb them. And then if they have an actual enemy who's opposing the uh, you know imperialist model of the U.S. like Assad, uh, they can then position their fake enemy Al, Al Qaeda in the places where they want to bomb illegally, and then they can bomb Al Qaeda. We're bombing Al Qaeda, but they actually are not targeting and actually trying to kill their Al Qaeda uh, de facto fighters on the ground. They uh, they could then have full control of the battle space. They belittle Assad. He's not even part of the war. They're fighting their puppet. And they can move this puppet war wherever they want around Syria. It's a really very clever strategy. Yes, it is. In in 2013, Jack Sullivan, when he sent his email to Hillary Clinton telling him Al-Qaeda is on our side in Syria, this is a leaked uh, email now that we know. And uh, what, what you mentioned is very correct because uh, they positioned Al-Qaeda and all this Muslim Brotherhood and the rest of the radicals against the Syrian government in the hope that these groups will remove Assad. But if they remove Assad, and because in front of the people, they say these people are uh, the Islamists are also our enemies. 
they come yeah. they have a they have a justification now when they remove Assad to come and occupy Syria in uh, under the pretext of fighting terrorism right it, it, it doesn't take it doesn't take a genius to understand this therefore i would mention this uh, in the west the most hated uh, mig- uh, migrant from the middle east are the people who understand these details if you yeah. come if you come to the to their countries and you just shut your mouth and you just go with the narrative you will reach to the highest positions that you can ever imagine because they have this identity politics here they want more migrants more refugees to be in positions of power you can Inclusive. become rich very famous you can become very rich you can do a lot but if you come here and tell them hold on bro i know i know your intentions look i'm not stupid you know like i sit i sit with mainstream journalists because they visit berlin and they're like oh we know you let's let's grab a coffee and i tell them look this is uh, off uh, the record we, you're not going to record this is not an interview we can chat i don't mind and when they speak like i look at them and i say like do you really think i'm a stupid like really really and i and i asked them and they start laughing from like under their nose you see like they know that we know like bro like we're not new in this scene you know what are you yeah. what are you? you can fool you can fool the other types of syrians but not me like i've been in this for a very long time let's speak facts this but is they're what not you want. journalists that's the like problem this. you have to use different words yeah i mean uh, the, the title is a journalist but at the end they look uh, like a few few hundred years ago there were these uh, po- poets in in the palace uh, writing uh, <laughs> you know they, they are giving all these nice words about yeah. the ruler and stuff and now these those are the journalists doing this uh, yeah. uh, yeah. They, because they, they, unfortunately yeah Go ahead, because Sarah. unfortunately there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of uh, like these refugees or immigrants who, because, you know, a lot of them have uh, escaped war or difficult conditions. And some of them, for example, the ones that have uh, immigrated out from Iran, they do not have those very difficult conditions as some of other, some other immigrants uh, experience. And that's why I think they are a very different type or for uh, also immigrants from like Cuba or Venezuela to other countries because they're not escaping war. Uh, and propaganda is very effective in uh, forming um, their opinion of their country and then choosing to live, for example, in Europe. And the problem is a lot of them, because they want to assimilate with the new country that they have chosen to live, they just go by the propaganda and they are even worse in repeating the propaganda. Uh, I'm telling this about, uh, I mean, specifically about Iranian expats who play a really huge part in uh, in the propaganda <laughs> against a country. And yes, they, they're they even were. worse they were they're even worse than they were demonstrating yesterday here in berlin we went to demo uh, oh, in front of the american embassy and they were on the other side and uh, the those are the shah people look uh, i i'll be very honest with you everyone has the right to have his own political opinion but it's 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 not an opinion when you want to bomb your country <laughs> it's not an exactly. opinion exactly or sanction you... your country like... <laughs> it's like... How do you like this like, uh, this uh, I, I, Hollywood actress? I still don't want to cancel you, you know. Like you can you can go exactly. in front of the embassy and say I want to uh bomb my country, but don't expect me to respect you like when you have such an opinion. This is this is the maximum exactly. that I this is my behavior with them. Yesterday we were in a demo in front of the American embassy and the woman came like she was blonde with blue eyes i thought she's german at the beginning and and she like penetrated in our demo and she started uh, making a scene yelling and she came with her camera to my face and she's telling me in english ah you're also here and i'm like who are you are you german are you syrian are you english i don't know why you're speaking english to me anyways and uh, she tried to provoke me so that I would maybe touch her or push her. What are you doing? Why are you recording me? Something like that. And uh, when she couldn't uh, uh, provoke me, she started to make a scene that uh, those are the Assad people. Uh, they support the dictator. She went to the police telling them that these people shouldn't be demonstrating here because they support the dictator. And then she posted the video at night uh, online um, on her Facebook. Somebody sent me. She says, like, I assaulted her. 
she says her hand was almost broken. She says her her arm was almost broken. And then I I I I I, 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 assault, I assaulted her, and that she reported me to the police. I'm not sure if she did it or not, but if she did it, I have an evidence because uh, I was live streaming for my Siviana analysis, and I went back nice. to the footage, and everything is clear. Like Just make sure you back up this, that footage. This, this sure woman, you yeah, that you footage, have to. Delete this, that. Yeah. this woman was literally trying to provoke me, and I wasn't provoked. And I just told her, "Shame on you for supporting the sanctions on Syria." So this is not even a, a, a slur. Uh, she can't uh, even uh, sue me for that. And <laughs> now I'm reading the law. If she reported me to the police, uh, I can sue her back because this is a false accusation. I guess. Yeah, you definitely should. But this is what they try to do. And on the other side, there were the the uh, Iranian expats. So the Iranian expats or this uh, oppositionists and the Syrian oppositionists and the Cuban oppositionists, they share the same mentality because the trainer is That's... the same. The well, American... You also might want to double check the law that if she publicly states that she reported you to the police, that may also be Ill illegal. She because... did. She did. She did. You should she... double check the law because in some jurisdictions, just publicly, because that means you're bringing extra work to the police. Uh, and and they and you're not you're so in other words you're bringing the police into a legal matter when in fact they aren't part of it so yeah. some in some places that could be actually illegal so you should double check that too i mean That's if she terrible. reported me to the police in a few days i receive a letter i will receive a letter to the police for investigation and i can just yeah. simply send them the video uh it's pretty pretty clear that i didn't yeah. even touch her she but said did you find out <laughs> yeah. she counters too though she sure. said, yeah. her, did um, you find out if she I was uh yeah. where she was from She's Syrian, Originally? apparently. Uh, she's Syrian. from Homs, okay. and she's a TikToker. And if you see her videos on oh, TikTok, okay. she's just like Don't showing her, her showing her duck face and all this stuff. Like, uh, sorry, this is this if this is what you do, do what you do, you know. But don't come to me when yeah. stay when, out of it. Exactly, when, like this. When, like this Hollywood actress for Iranian, like she, I don't understand. Like she, you are a Hollywood actress with, and you're saying that you left Iran when you were, I don't know, like two, six months old or something. Like she has never lived in Iran and she's so detached from the Iranian society. So she can't even claim that she has escaped uh, the Mullah's regime or anything. And she was describing uh, the U.S. illegal sanctions on Iranians as like she was asked because uh if she thinks the sanctions are good to impose on Iran and she uh, because they hurt ordinary people and she was like well yes they are like chemotherapy and when you chemotherapy like uh, when when someone receives chemotherapy uh, the bad cells die but the, some of the good cells also die like this is how she feels about sanctions on her own people how can she represent um, uh, Iranian people like, she doesn't have any idea of what the sanctions are doing to ordinary Iranians inside her. and to women and, yeah, like particularly you said, just, too yeah, exactly, women, women. to women. Because women exactly. are always, and women are usually uh, vulnerable people in every society. And imagine that these sanctions are um, hindering their development, their ability to be, probably some people want to be more, have a more free, because they want to have a more intellectual capacity. They are hindering this process uh, in Iran, and yeah, they are exactly. doing the same thing in Syria. And the question is, if these sanctions weren't, uh, like blocking humanitarian aid to Syria, why did the United States suspend it for six months? Exactly. Right? So this yeah, is. I was what, going to ask you about this. That is, this, is, yeah. this is this is what I want to talk with the Syrian opposition is. But um, how can I talk intellectually uh, with them? This is my problem. And uh, Imam Ali always uh, said that uh, every time I discuss an ignorant, uh, he will tire me. Like he will tire you. This person, uh, I, I, I can't. He, she can't go up to me. I should go down to her. And that's not my style. I cannot discuss with them. So they yeah. try just to provoke. The same thing for the Iranians that they're calling for sanctions. And I know few Iranians here, they're all like brutally for sanctions. and but, like, but 
uh, do you have anyone in Iran? Like, uh, do you have a family? Do, do you are you attached to someone? Do you have a friend? Do you know how much this hurts? Do you know that uh, it, it, when the economic situation deteriorates, that means the society uh, disintegrates, the society be collapses, and the educational system becomes bad, the health sector be, like so. You yeah. uh, this is this is actually a collective punishment for the people uh, for the policy exactly. of their government, for example, right? Like, uh, and lots of people support the policy of their government. And so if you support a democratic uh, uh, system, uh, this is what the people chose. And if you have a different opinion, go to Iran and change it. I don't understand why do you want to change it here from Berlin? Just like the so-called revolutionaries, they want to change the regime in Syria from here in Berlin. Bro, you have a co- you. They had half. The they don't want to pay uh, any price. They don't want to pay any price yeah, for it. They, like they sit in their um, mansions in, I don't know, the US or Canada or Europe and Like some of the Iranian expat actually said, uh, like Kavisha, who's um, f- who lives in Canada and who has been calling for uh, sanctions on Iran and designating the IRGC as a terrorist group and whatever. He has said that even if the regime in Iran changes, I don't think I will ever go back to live there. So why are you ch- why are you trying yeah. to change a government that you would never go and live there? Like stay out of it. You want to be a Canadian, and you uh, he has been bragging about. Uh, he has called um, I forgot his name. Uh, this uh, Zionist, uh, I think Irvin Cutler or something. He has been calling him as his mentor. So mm. you, it's clear where you come from. You don't stand for Iranian people. You just stay out of it and don't. And the thing about Iranian, like not uh, this guy, but a lot of Iranian expats is that um, I don't know about other uh, expat communities, but about Iranians. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen from uh, some of these other um, uh, like expat communities that they go, like they immigrate to other countries and they work hard there and some of them send money back home like because of the financial issues that they might have but the ones it's famous among Iranians that the Iranian expats you, they usually get their money from their fathers inside Iran so like and they don't some of them do, do not withdraw from receiving subsidies from the Iranian government while they're living in another country this is and like they spending Iranian money in uh, those countries they're acting against and they're talking against uh, the Iranian this government is typical, this is so bad why are- this is typical mentality also for the Syrian oppositionists and that's why i say because the trainer is the same and it's not like they're trained directly but they were told how to behave and yeah. uh, w- when when you have a uh, iranian or a syrian is asking for sanctions in syria i'm sorry but this is this is this is uh, the least to say is the least unpatriotic thing to do like I, and it also could mount to treason and uh, calling syrian to, thing these uh, activists here should be against yeah, sanctions yeah like yeah. Ima- imagine imagine after an earthquake what kind of a human you should be seriously what kind of human should you should be to come to our demo and and try to say uh, like we're doing a propaganda for Assad and the sanctions do not impact the humanitarian aid in Syria what kind of human could you could be like don't you have anyone in Syria don't you know that after the Caesar act the prices increased 800 times like uh, if if something was a one lira it's now 800 lira why do you think it has happened after the Caesar act why do you think because the energy sector is sanctioned the united states occupies the fuel fields the uh, banking system is, is is sanctioned the energy sector everything is interrelated to each other how can i uh, as a uh, as a state uh, repair uh, water pumps if the companies refuse to sell me uh, the spare parts because they're afraid of the overcompliance and uh, they're because they're overcompliant and they're afraid of the american sanctions and this is what alena duhan exactly. the un special rapporteur on the impact of unilateral sanctions said like she was in syria and she's meeting with the uh, non-governmental organizations un representatives like you you have un representatives saying that they want to buy spare parts for their personal cars from like they can't buy it because they can't pay uh, make a transaction and to the companies are afraid to sell them these uh, parts because they they're afraid of the american sanctions this is all facts exactly. those are facts i guess it's no surprise if the act the caesar act is named after history's most famous imperialist 
Like, <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah, and, it's and, interesting how where that name comes uh, from, but it is pretty ironic. And this guy, and this guy who came to the United States claiming he has uh, fifty thousand photos uh, of uh, uh, of detainees who were killed under the uh, Assad regime. When you don't, you cannot name them. You cannot uh, present an evidence for them. Iran, you don't even Iran's show. 50, you, you don't. Prisoners. You, you you refuse even to show your face. And even the Human Rights Watch, which is uh, which is really biased towards these so-called rebels, they said Absolutely. at least the pictures that they watched, they say at least half the pictures that they watched, it seems that they were Syrian soldiers, that they uh, they were killed and they were photographed as uh, victims for from. So um it's 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 very easy nowadays to create narratives because in the united states you have the uh, apac this works very 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 hard and you have the qatari uh, lobby they're aligned by the way with the israelis there to uh, the scissor act is a work of the uh, apac and the qataris the, it's not yeah. trump himself who um wrote this it was a big project uh, no. by these two lobby yeah Trump, Trump, to Trump be honest, Trump is just a puppet. <laughs> I, I mean, faces, face. This president's going to come, but what is what has changed since I opened my eyes to to politics? What has changed in the foreign policy of the United States? Don't you Americans question themselves if, uh, if uh, w like I, I lived George W. Bush and then came Obama two times and then Trump and now Biden? Like, what has changed? What is the difference between Democratic and Republican except the priorities? The Republicans say we first have to find Iran and China and then Russia. And the Democrats say, no, first Russia and then and then Iran and, and China. It's like it's, it's a matter. It's a matter of priority for them. They there is a deep state. In the United States, and um, uh, they uh, control the politicians. They bring them to positions of power. They have to be accepted by the establishment, including the so-called squad, AOC, uh, Omar, all these figures. In my opinion, just to give you the the uh, fake impression that you have a choice to choose, that yeah. uh, you have someone who could be an oppositionist in the Democratic Party, which is uh, like laughable. Every time, yeah. every every in every test that they had to vote, like force the vote. You remember the the medical uh, uh, yeah. Medicare for all, uh, sending weapons to Ukraine. All of them, they they just voted with the establishment. So on the strategic decisions, they're all with it. they're part of it. Even if in their hearts they would have a different opinion, but they would know they would be grilled, they would lose their positions. Imagine you're an AOC. This like, she's a really actor, right? This woman is the is the worst actor ever. But yes, she before she came to power, before she became a congresswoman, she was saying yeah, like really nice things, even to Jimmy Dore on, on on his show, right? But when these people sit on on a chair. In the position of power it's very difficult for you to accept that you would go against the tide and stay and survive and i think one uh, solution to that is like if the oscars they added a category for like political acting because i think that's what we start we really need now it's like uh, yeah. we need to well, like Brad honor that. the actors in the politics as well because it's all just a giant show. You know who is yeah. awake from the Hollywood in in Hollywood in the in the United States. The only person who is awake, not work, is Gervais. What was his name? Uh, Gervais, right? This, oh, Ricky Gervais. Uh, Ricky yeah. Gervais. But he's That's, a UK. He's in the. He's British. He's think, British. Right? Yeah, yeah. But but he really shows them what they deserve. They tell them what they deserve to hear. Yeah. Um, so in my opinion, in the states, uh, Omar or AOC and the rest. Um, on minor issues, they can make a difference. On bigger issues, if they go against the tide, they will not be elected again. And if they do big opposition, like real work, and uh, they will be suicided. Like yeah, it's so not a joke. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. People get murdered in in the in the political and journalistic scene in the United States if they do like uh, real harm to the establishment. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, with the um, like, um, what is it? The so-called uh, temporarily lifting of the sanctions on uh, Syria. Do you think it it is going to actually facilitate humanitarian aid's delivery to 
the affected areas in Syria? So they uh, suspended it for six months and they say um, for humanitarian grounds. It, uh, the only thing that I have seen for now that is possible is transactions to Syria. So that's why I encourage Syrians multiple times to, uh, to, like, to deliver as much as uh, dollars, euros to Syria just to support the Syrian lira as well. Uh, but no aid has arrived yet to Syria except from Italy. Italy sent its uh, cargo to Lebanon, not to Damascus. So I am sometimes optimistic, sometimes not. I think it would be very, very difficult for them to restore the sanctions after six months because uh, the regional countries, uh, and I will mention particularly now Algeria, Iraq, United Arab Emirates, uh, and now Saudi Arabia also asked for permission to send uh, aid. Um, uh, Egypt, there is a de facto breaking of the siege on Syria. It will be very difficult for these countries to re-boycott Syria. I'm talking about the regional countries. Yeah. And if there is a rapprochement between Syria and Turkey with the mediation of uh, uh, Russia, this will be another another good news. Uh, because, look, look I, I didn't mention Iran because Iran is already has relations, but th those who were really following the American policy in the region, those when they come back to Syria and Tunisia, for example, increased the level of representation from uh, charge d'affaires to an ambassador, those are good news. They're not going to decrease the representation levels after six months. So the Western countries, nobody needs them in Syria. They don't need their yeah, money. Exactly. They don't need their companies. The, the 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 in my opinion, the industrial powerhouse is shifting from the west to the east, and especially after uh, the Nord Stream blast. Germany is not going to be one of the biggest industrial countries in five to ten years. People should understand that the prices oh, here. Oh, thanks are to the U.S. <laughs> the U.S. is really <laughs> deindustrializing. I don't know. I don't know anything, guys. If it's the U.S. or not. Otherwise, uh, this the SWAT could come now into my apartment. <laughs> yeah, okay. I yeah, don't know. Not the US. Not yeah, the US. we don't know. Which is a liar. We don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know what's happening because 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 you can. The, yesterday, uh, two days ago, actually, there is a nice, uh, good outlet here, uh, media outlet, which is alternative on the YouTube, young and naive, and he. Uh, asked uh, questions, serious questions, to the spokesperson for the foreign ministry about uh, him, Simmer Hirsch's uh, article. And she said, these are just hypotheses, uh, what he <laughs> said. And, 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 and he said, OK, let's suppose the hypothesis is correct. And uh, your intelligence proved that it is uh, the Americans. What are you going to do about it? And she, and okay. she, 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 she said, it's again, it's just an hypothesis. We don't know. But he says, but you were accusing <laughs> Russia. You you accuse yeah. you accuse three times Russia of blowing up the pipeline without exactly. an evidence. But just when we hypothesis. have an evidence, when we have an uh, evidence on, <laughs> on the United States, it's just an hypothesis. Just like when Azerbaijan attacked Armenia the last time on, on the Armenian territory, it's not in the disputed nagorno karabakh They were asking the foreign ministry uh, spokesperson, so what's the position of Germany? And they said uh, uh, many days, many days for two weeks, every day the same question. And they say, oh, we're waiting for evaluation uh, from uh, the Armenian side or from the Azerbaijani side. They don't want to criticize Azerbaijan because they're getting uh, now uh, gas uh, from Azerbaijan. So it's fine for Azerbaijan to do what they do, but Whatever if Russia, but, mm -hmm. but Russia, I, I didn't expect that there would be this much of hate towards Russians. It's, the Russian, it's, look, the Russian pipeline suicided itself. Just, just so you know, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. It blows out itself. And the yeah. thing is, yeah. and the thing is, there are there are people. Uh, my wife the other day was telling me, it's like Kevork. I have friends, and they are really well educated. Like really, like they have like a master or a PhD, and they're telling me Russia blew up its own pi pipeline. Like, does it make yeah. sense for you? Well, they're she's, the same ones injecting themselves with the yeah, drop of the hat. Like, I don't she's, understand. 
I mean, she's 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 uh, uh, like um, very awake, and uh, I I explain to her the situation, and she says like, what you say it makes more sense, like because uh, the Russians do not have an interest in blowing up their own gas pipeline, and their interest is economic integration with Germany, because nothing scares or nothing damages the American supremacy in Europe, and that means in Eurasia more than. Uh, uh, good relations between Germany and Russia, Russian gas, manpower, German industry and technology. If these two countries come together, the American supremacy and hegemony will end over Europe. And they are, they said we will stop the Nord Stream 2 in one way or another. <laughs> what yeah. does it mean in one exactly. way or another? One way means exactly. diplomatic. The other way means be blowing up. Like we're not stupid. I mean, <laughs> we, we heard thing, you. Yeah, that's true. But the most interesting thing in Hirsch's piece is that exact thing is that he talked about that the legal, like the they didn't have to do this under covert authorization. So if you do a covert action with the American military, you have to get congressional approval in a secret congressional like uh, intelligence committee, and they, they could skip that and they could just do it under Biden's order because Biden himself said that he would do it publicly. He said, we will do this one way or another. And him speaking those words publicly allowed legally for them to not even do it secretly. So they, you, they didn't have to involve any other politician. They just used regular, they didn't, they didn't use special forces. They used regular diving team uh, from the Navy to go do it. So yes. it's fascinating the the way those words actually him speaking those words actually was legally significant. And, and the body language is, when when Biden was asked, okay, so what are you gonna do about it? Because when he said we will stop it in one way or another, and the journalists f follow up with another question, so what are you gonna do about it? And he yeah. said, and 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 you know these uh, very toxic masculine guys when they say, I promise you, I will do it. Like I will kick his. As you yeah. know, like yeah. I promise, we will do it. Like, like, bro, we can do it. What are you talking about? It's like, you can see, like, you can feel him. You know, it's what there. is he yeah. saying? <laughs> wow. Yeah, but what is amazing to me, I mean, as someone from Iran and living in Iran, is how uh, the European governments and European countries are just willingly. Just give in to U.S. policies, even though they're hurting their own economies and their own people this is very difficult for me to understand like why would you do it and you're not i mean if some countries in in this region do that i could for example say that it's because of the fear of i don't know sanctions it's because their economies are not thriving or anything but europe does not have those problems why would you hurt your own citizens and harm your own economy because you can't say no to the u.s this is you, you have to know in Germany, uh, uh, so the coalition that rules Germany, two of them uh, are the Social Democrats and the Greens. The, the other one is the Free Democratic Party. But Free Democratic Party is the uh, least powerful party in the coalition. So these two uh, parties, the Social Democrats and the Greens, they were already calling for uh, stopping the Nord Stream before they come to power. They wanted to stop oh, it wow. even before they come to power. It was in their program. So this has came like uh, it's like from God for them, you know, like they stopped the Nord Stream yeah. because they want clean energy, whatever that means, because uh, the cleanest energy that they could have had is this Russian gas, which uh, with uh, with the cheapest prices that supports their own industry. Now, what is the alternative? They're buying the same gas that the Indians and the Chinese bought for on the long term, they stored it like they can they can have gas in the next 50 years. They stored it in their in their countries and now selling some of them to Europe, the same Russian gas for three times uh, the price. Yeah. And they're buying the American liquefied natural gas again, three times more expensive from from the United States. And accordingly, wh who do you think is paying for these prices? I mean, I'm not even a German. But I'm also paying because whatever I buy, it has become yeah. at, at sometimes 100% more expensive. And I'm not exaggerating because what happens is mm -hmm. like on the bigger things, like when, when you're buying something for $50 and it has become $55, you don't feel the difference. But, uh, but when it is, uh, so you, you're buying a cheese for $1 and now it's $2. 
right? You don't you don't count that as a hundred percent because between one dollar and two dollar you don't yeah. feel there is a big difference. But when you're coming to the cashier, like when I used to buy like let's say for food for two days for me and for my wife or everything with meat and veggies and stuff, it's now between eighty to hundred euros wow. for two days. It's it's too it's too expensive now. It's too expensive. The electricity bill was forty five. Now it's eighty euros I'm paying per month. And they don't even ask you. They don't even tell you that we increase the prices. They just start taking the money from your bank account without even changing the contract. They don't ask you if you want to pay that money or can you pay that money. Wow, that's wow, that's that's unbelievable. That's really that's un that's unmanageable. Think, that's going to cause think the, a revolution. I, I think the support for uh, Ukraine has diminished in Germany after now one year of war. Uh, at the beginning, everything becomes very fancy and very co politically correct thing to do. But when the people start feeling that the burden is on their shoulders, people think about themselves. So this is just my personal uh, expectation that could happen. What what could happen in Germany is is a, is a big recession, a big economic uh, recession and a crisis here that the people would like to vote and choose a party that wasn't responsible for this, right? And wasn't a part of the establishment. And now we are talking about the AFD, Alternative for Germany, which is the right wing party. And if they vote for the AFD and the AFD uh, promises to restore the, uh, the ties with Russia, uh, remove the sanctions and restore the Nord Stream 2 pipelines, this will give a credibility to the AFD among the people. But socially, I think the AFD could uh, present a big challenge to the society because they are um, not accepting uh, the refugees. migrant community and refugees here, which will cause a problem because uh, for example, Syrians, still 50% uh, of them who arrived in 2014 and 15, they're on the job center, which means they're living on the social benefits of the taxpayers. So th there will be an attempt to deport these people. There will be an attempt to deport uh, the migrants and the refugees who haven't integrated into society. They didn't learn the language. They, didn't, they don't work, you know. Uh, this is politically incorrect for this uh, for the German society. They don't want these things because they want to do the good thing, right? So this could bring a social challenge, um, like Trump did. He divided the country, like like uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans. This was the biggest polarization that I have seen in the United States in the recent years. So this could also happen in Germany. And uh, this could bring a big cha challenge for Germany on a social and security level. Let's see. I hope really, I really hope that um, the left wing voices in Germany, like Zara Wagenicht, uh, can mobilize more people. They have unfortunately very little. The left, uh, the left party has got only 4.9 percent in the last elections and they're supposed to be anti-imperialist but even half the half the party of the left party which is called linke they're with the for the war with ukraine so what happened is in my opinion there was a consistent work to penetrate the left-wing parties all around europe all around the western world and the left parties have become neoliberal parties and they are interested in more uh, the Greta Thunberg style of, <laughs> of speeches. Green war. Than, yeah, yeah, like uh, like a, imagine um, a politician like Zara Wagenicht. In my opinion, she's the most reputable politician that she understands uh, what's happening like, in the world. And she's a really anti-imperialist. And I love her, you know. They call her a conspiracy theorist. They fight her even within her own party. So... There is no left-wing party in Germany who could challenge this system here. The only party that can challenge the system here is the right-wing party. So, and and Same and here. and, really and sad. yeah, like uh, like imagine East Germany, which is which was historically communist. They're voting for AfD. They're voting for the right-wing party. They're not voting for the uh, left-wing parties. So the uh, the ex-communist socialists, uh, uh, those who lived under the DDR, DDR, they're all voting for AfD. The biggest uh, voter share for AfD is in Eastern Germany, which was historically, wow, <laughs> not, <That's> not, <laughs> you know, uh, yes. Yeah. And and now the Germans say, yeah, 
those are the zurückgebliebenen Leute. That means those are the backward people who vote for the AFD now. Wow, but, but the, un, the un basket un of deplorables. That's what Hillary Clinton called them here, the basket of deplorables. So they don't see wow. why these people are voting for the right wing party. So they don't solve the root of the causes. This is what I speak. Like I told them, guys, there there are reasons why they vote for the uh, right wing parties, right? And if you don't solve the root causes, I mean, don't expect a different outcome. But but by bashing the people and telling them that these are the ignorant people voting for this party that is challenging the system, uh, you're just encouraging them to vote more for, for this party. Yeah, right? just kidding. <laughs> Wow, that that's really interesting. I mean, I I wanted to comment a little bit about Syria uh, as we kind of wrap up. Is uh, uh, you were talking about at the beginning about information sharing about how that threatens the West, but I think something like that's also threatening the West, which is impossible for the West to address, is the idea of like empathy sharing. Because like there's there's no there is zero empathy. Like you were saying, like the U.S. is openly saying we're not going to contribute to reconstruction in Syria. We're going to block, uh, you know, we're going to bomb humanitarian convoys or support our allies in bombing humanitarian convoys. And then China has to come out and say, drop the sanctions. China has to be the one standing on the side of basic human decency. And so what does that say to the, all the rest of the world who the West is supposed to be trying to win hearts and minds of? Like, I mean, they're all looking at China like, yeah, well, I guess China is way, way more humanitarian than the West. So you're they're they're drawing all of the eyes of the world uh, actually to away from the west the west is is showing their face supporting nazis in ukraine you know all this horrible stuff and it's just it's just every day it's more obvious that the west the masks is have fallen huh the masks have fallen in my opinion yeah. it's so they are so naked now in front of their people and in front of other people how do in we my... not have a world war after that because like all the other people are going to oppose the west how do we not, how do we avoid a massive conflict that's a really good question and i'm afraid that the war in ukraine is not going to end up in a peaceful manner uh it, they will be they they will push us uh, to the edge of abyss before they think of negotiations for now they're not thinking about negotiations until we reach into the edge uh, to the edge of uh, let's say nuclear war or an armageddon the look in the military people know in the Pentagon and in the Russian forces, and they are still in contact, and they, like they are in contact in Syria. The military people know what means nuclear war. So I'm just counting on this particular thing that probably when it happens like the Cuban Missile Crisis, maybe back channels start to be reactivated. But at the same time, the Cuban Missile Crisis wasn't an indication of the change in the international system. But what's happening in Ukraine, it could completely end the Western hegemony over the world. So their, their fate is also at stake. If you, if you put yourself in their shoes, they don't want to lose their leverage. They don't want to lose their uh, status. They want to continue ruling the world, right? And there is, yeah. the, and what we are really saying is, let's, let's, create a multipolar system like if you see what russia and china say they never say we don't want the west to be part of the international community they call them our partners and they say let's do it together <laughs> like you we we can benefit from your expertise and we also want to be part they don't want to cancel them right but um so this is the part where i think the people who are in charge in the United States, they wouldn't accept to share this power with the rest of the world. And this is where the real danger lies, because uh, a crumbling empire can uh, act hysterically and can act irrationally. And this is what I'm afraid of uh, um, in, in the case of the United States. But in Syria, I think in 2013, when the former foreign minister of Syria, Walid al-Ma'alem, said, we will forget that Europe is on the map or the West on the map and we will uh, direct our efforts to the East. Um, even the poor government people made fun of him. Like, how can we survive without Europe? You know, how can we survive without the West? But I think now after the earthquake, everybody knows in Syria, whether pro or against Assad, who is their friend? And who's sanctioning them and who came for uh, for uh, for aiding the syrian people everything is clear 
for anyone with two functioning brain cells knows who is the friend of Syria and who can be on your side during such uh, crisis and also domestically. Now, everybody knows whether pro or against that the sanctions were the main factor for not delivering the humanitarian aid. And people like myself, I'm more genuine about my reporting about the case of Syria than all these influencers with hundreds of thousands of followers who uh, were preaching day and night that, no, we have to keep the sanctions on Syria because it doesn't affect the humanitarian case. But the people saw on the ground after, after a disaster, people can believe their objective, their eyes, it's the objective truth in front of their eyes. They can see that what I'm saying is the truth and what they are saying is, 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 is not uh, uh, accurate. So, well, when Algeria has to send fighter jets to deliver bandages or whatever, I mean, you've got to be kidding me. That yep. is, yeah, yep. well, <clears throat> amazing. Um, I don't know, Kevork, if you've been to Iran or not, but in Esfahan, in my city where I live, there is a, a, an Armenian community in an Armenian district, and there is yes. an Armenian cathedral. And inside that cathedral, there is a museum about the genocide of the Armenian people. So if anyone visits Asfahan, they can go I, I, and visit I, If, if I visit Iran, I would definitely visit Asfahan. And it's, my, it's on my uh, list of uh, countries that I would like to visit. Um, let's hope if I go to Armenia, it would be easier to come to Iran uh, back then, and we would definitely meet. Do you have anything yeah, else you would yeah, like to yeah. share with people? Uh, in terms of like your channels or how people could get in touch with you, or well, people can follow me on Twitter if they want, Kevork Almasian, or on YouTube, Syriana Analysis. You know this movie called Syriana, but just add analysis. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Much better option. <laughs> yeah, I regularly also post interviews, we'll add them. podcasts, and um, yeah, just want to. Um, I feel like it's a duty to raise awareness and open eyes for, of the people because I think people like us can make the world a better place. And uh, and when we um, uh, establish uh, bridges between different uh, people uh, who share uh, uh, humanistic values, which we really don't want to harm anyone. Like I, I live in Germany and I love this country. And I don't want anyone to be harmed. And sometimes when I talk about the case for example, the Nord Stream, because I'm, I'm, I, I feel hurt that the people do not know what's going to happen to Germany. The same thing to Syria. I want to open eyes that say, guys, this is what your country did to Syria. And this is why you have two million refugees here. Not because people woke up in the morning and decided to walk to, <laughs> to Europe in the Balkans. So... Um, it's a difficult job to do, but I think uh, um, uh, people in general, they have a sense of feeling if you are a genuine with them or not. And after five years, me on YouTube, even though they try to say lots of things about me, people who have a firsthand experience watching you can read your body language and can see like you're honest with them and you don't have an agenda. You just want to show them the other side of the story so that they can make up their minds, right? It's not like you're trying to tell them how to think. So this is the difference between us and the mainstream media. Yeah. yeah thank you so much for your efforts on um, showing the truth and thank you for your time. This is also our mission with our podcast. We're very new. So it hasn't been even a year and we're just trying and um, yeah, it's great to establish those connections and meet yes. people who care about the truth and care about the people of the world. The things yes. that we're saying and sharing is it's that we don't want the people in Europe or in US or in Iran or anywhere in, in the world to get hurt by policies that could be just different. Exactly. Thank you so much, uh, guys, for having me. It's a real yeah. pleasure. I will definitely host you guys on my channel and also push for your podcast so that also my followers would be introduced to yours. Because uh, it difference of opinion, difference of opinions do not harm guys. It's just like if you don't like what they say, you can just close your ears or not watch, but just listen to other side of the story, whether on Iran or elsewhere, because on Iran also people have strong opinions which are against, but listen to other people. Maybe you learn something, maybe you change your mind or maybe not. It doesn't harm anyone. <laughs> right. And also, I think just trying to understand where the other people are coming from. Like, I think that helps un explain a lot of the miscommunication. Some people, yes. yeah, come from a position of, you know, 
different there's been different governments and different people's revolutions and when those yes. things happen you get different emotional connections to the past exactly so yeah. all right well uh thanks everyone for joining us for another episode of twice told tales podcast we'll see you again next time Thank you.